we are dedicating this first day to covering what key stakeholders from the research, business and institutions fields are doing to contribute to plastic circularity. And in this particular session, we'll look at what institutions and specifically cities are doing in this sector. So, as you know, at least what this makes me think about is um, the fact that the COP26 conference is coming up um, very soon, just a few weeks from now. And cities will be under a microscope, actually, um, as generators of wastes uh, and, and, and um, greenhouse gas emissions. And I think this makes our conversation today even more relevant. So I think cities are a key part of the circular economy agenda, and uh, they play a critical role in unlocking related um, economic, environmental, and social benefits. So I'm very happy to be in the presence of um, local authorities and uh, urban planning experts who can then share their experience of um, working closely with cities to enable circularity at that level. Now, I'll introduce myself quickly. Um, as I said, my name is Lise, and I'm a media communications professional. Until recently, I was working with the Break Free from Plastics movement hosted at Zero Waste Europe in Brussels. Um, I was working also prior to that in the fields of inclusive business with uh, all sorts of entrepreneurs, um, social entrepreneurs, and also in the fields of green economy and the SDGs, sustainable development goals, and prior to that, um, also on the new urban agenda with uh, the United Nations um, Agency uh, for, for Cities. So there I worked on policies for inclusive and sustainable cities. Um, and so it is always my interest when I hear uh, about conversations at the crossroads of uh, urban planning and sustainability and circularity. So uh, I'll be moderating this session today and I'll be hopefully getting to the heart of the matter with uh, the distinguished experts joining me. And speaking of which, I'm uh, very honored to be in the presence of, um, first of all, Anne Slot. Um, hello, Anne. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'll see if I can live up to to the distinguished expert title. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> definitely are. Um, I, I also have Sam and Clement with me today. Is, is Simon with us? Yes, Simon's just trying to find the mute button. That's all. So, yes, <laughs> nice to be with you all. <laughs> Welcome. Um, and we have uh, Nicolas Sodak as well uh, with us present. So each of these um, speakers um, is actually very active in the field of um, uh, cities and circularity in their own way. And I'm very happy that we have someone from the corporate sector, someone from the uh, uh, municipality angle, and someone from Icle who is, uh, um, is uh, specializing in um, uh, basically, uh, it, which is a network of, of, of cities. Um, so I would like to introduce each of you. Um, and I think what we will do is then go into your presentation uh, right away. So what we can do is then um, the, we'll have Anne's presentation first, um, and um, and then go further to Simon, uh, who will talk about his work with Eclay, and then Nicolas Vodak. Uh, I just wanted to say a general hello to everyone before starting the, the introduction, so it doesn't last too long uh, with me, just me talking on the screen. Um, so Anne-Louise Slot, you are the coordinator for the Pilot City Vile in Denmark uh, for Project Reflow. And as I understand, Reflow is an EU funded project which seeks to understand and transform urban material flows, uh, co-create and test regenerative solutions at business governance and citizen levels to create a resilient circular economy. So you work at the Innovation Department in Violet Municipality with a strong focus on local engagement with industry stakeholders um, 
citizens, entrepreneurs, and public institutions. You are an anthropologist um, and you have worked for over 15 years in the field of sustainability, social innovation, and stakeholder involvement. Welcome, Anne. Thank Once you again. So much. And uh, I understand that your presentation will be on your work with Reflow, where you try to achieve more circularity through engagements of both citizens, public institutions, and companies. So how do you do that? Uh, I'm looking forward to your examples and pitfalls and uh, successes um, and um, all of that very interesting uh, experience. Thank so you I'll so give the floor over to you um, and then we will uh, we will continue with uh, the other presentations. So over to you and okay. presentation. Thank you so much, Liz. I'm happy to be here with all of you. I'll just uh, jump right into it. I'll share my screen with you guys. Um, and so Liz, can you nod if you can see? Yes, you can. That's nice because I can only see you and not the rest of you guys. But Yes, um, as you said, I'm the project coordinator of, uh, of Reflow, which is a, a Horizon 2020 uh, project. Probably a, a lot of you maybe already know a little bit about it, um, but I, I will focus more or less into to that uh, for what we are doing in Weile, but of course also um, staging that in like a broader context of what we are doing in Weile and why and why we are working and how we are trying to work on the on the uh, circularity uh, agenda in, in different kinds of ways. So um, yes, so you can say in, in short there are different backgrounds for why uh, Reflow um, was an interesting project for us to, to co-create and now work on. Of course, there are, as you all know, EU legislations and a lot of new things coming also on concretely on plastics. So all municipalities also in Denmark has these issues on how can we minimize uh, the use of, uh, of plastic in our institutions and in our, in our cities. Besides that, you can say that in Denmark, there's a large focus on uh, on a national level, uh, on a strategy for circular economy and for climate and all of this. So, so that's also, you can say, a part of our uh, the context that we, we, we do this project in. Then in uh, 2020 last year, the municipality of Weile uh, decided on a, a climate plan um, that goes into different kinds of, of, uh, of issues, uh, but also on the, on the circularity of different resources and, of course, uh, CO2 emissions and so on. The picture in the, in the, um, in the right uh, below is a picture of a coming resource center that uh, will be built within the next year. This is, you can say, like the future waste plant uh, that we are building in Weile. And uh, the whole idea of that is uh, not looking at resources as waste, but looking at it as exactly as resources. So this center is uh, like groundbreaking for the way that uh, we think about um, waste and waste flows in the city and how we can work together further on both with citizens and, and companies and doing different partnerships to enhance this, uh, this agenda. So um, you can say that reflow in many ways are like the, the, the stepping stone and then we are working in a, in a broader sense also when reflow stops next summer uh, to incorporate all of the knowledge <clears throat> in, uh, in this resource uh, center. So this I hope give you some kind of idea as to what is the, the context and the, and the background for the project. So what are we concretely doing? Well, we aim to both reduce and recycle more plastic than we are doing right now. And uh, of course, we have different methods, methodologies of, of doing this together with the, the other um, uh, five uh, cities that work in Reflow. That is, for example, Milan and uh, Amsterdam and Paris, Berlin uh, are in the project as well. So um, we have done an, an MFA, uh, as you also mentioned, uh, Liz, like a material flow analysis of the whole city, understanding how the 
how the plastic flows in the city and how it is used and how it is distributed and and what are the waste streams uh, after it is used in the city as well as uh, stakeholder analysis and our own you can say very like local plastic waste analysis and uh, on the grounds of this we try we have done different ideations and we are doing now prototypes with our local stakeholders and and the whole idea of this is of course you can say how can you how can you work from the really work from the bottom up because what i just introduced um in regards to the background it's very like macro level things going on um but the whole idea of uh, reflow in Vaile is also to say how can we really en engage and let people also work together with us in in, in how we can lift this uh, this agenda. So this is done very concretely on testing uh, these testing sites or testing grounds um, and 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 connecting you can say people to to each other that uh, that. Um, that needs to be done in order to to actually lift this uh, this agenda. So you can say we work both in a very like systemic level where we focus on, for example, uh, sustainable procurement within uh, our own municipality and also look at broader like the value chains across uh, the city. And then we have this uh, involving uh, level that I just spoke about uh, before. I'll get much further into that, of course, that's the heart of our project. Um, so our basis for this, as I just mentioned before, is this research and analysis done that showed, you could say, both great potential for better sorting uh, um, so that we will actually uh, recycle the plastic. Uh, right now there's a huge problem that um, a lot of the plastic ends up in uh, incineration um, and are not being recycled, so we are working on that. And then also it showed uh, the demand for a more uh, sustainable procurement policy. I'll get a bit more into that as well, how we work on that. Um, then our stakeholder mapping also uh, showed us that there's a lack of, of knowledge on this because when we talk about EU projects, it's often like these uh, macro level methodologies. And if you live here in the Vista of Weile, <laughs> living a normal citizen's life, then OK, so why is that at all interesting for me? So this has been one of the um, uh, important key things for us as well is to take point of departure in in people's everyday life and trying to to um, create the changes uh, from there. I'll give you some examples on that a bit later. So yeah, you can say that um, as many projects do, we try to work from this analysis point of view. This is one of my colleagues, the first pictures uh, of Penlile doing our waste uh, own waste analysis. I actually, I had one of those very fine white gowns on myself and uh, helped on doing some of the analysis, which was great. We, uh, we have a local steering group committee that I will um, introduce to you in a minute, but this journey you can say from how do we get from analysis to scenarios and to concrete uh, actions. In this case, our local steering group committee is uh, very important. Uh, I don't expect for you to understand the, the Danish words in this overview, but just to show you that what we have done with the local steering group as a as a municipality, you can say we have brought people together from both the city council, from the uh, um, uh, um, from the environmental department on a national level. We have the uh, housing association here in the west of uh, Vaile. And we have uh, different key stakeholders from within the municipality uh, as well. And besides that, some, some experts on, on plastic also. So the whole idea of creating from the beginning this local steering group and also uh, in that way in introducing this to the politicians from the beginning and having them to take like concrete and direct actions in this steering group has been a way of, uh, of anchoring the project from the beginning on a political level. So uh, I was only two months into reflow when I was uh, invited to the director of the municipality and the mayor's office to introduce to them what we were actually planning on, on doing. 
and I know that they are following the project very closely from the from the city council. So the politicians in this local steering group has been a part of actually saying, OK, so we can if 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 these are the scenarios that uh, was actually came out of the analysis and the interviews and, and all of that, OK, how how can we somehow help um, help um, making these actions in the scenarios also on a political level from the beginning. Um, yes, I think this is one of the like main takeaways for us is that if you can engage so much the political level from the beginning, you actually have a, a quite um, a, a good connection or a good way of, of anchoring the knowledge, uh, not only in the end of the project, but uh, also during the project. So I'll just introduce to you just a few uh, examples from uh, our our different scenarios. Uh, we work at uh, a local site called Sophie Gone, uh, which is an elderly care center. Uh, there's these pictures from there. We work concretely on two different prototypes. One is uh, to understand how is it as a public institutions with the procurement policy. You have in the healthcare a lot of plastic, both in uh, in packaging, but also in the in the different health products that uh, that you use. And uh, and Edwards actually themselves who came and said we we have this really great problem because we have so much plastic, and and we're not even sure if the, if we sort it in the correct way or what to do with it. And is it, are there any kind of ways where we can actually decrease um, the use of plastic in, in healthcare, not just at our site, but also, of course, at the, at other uh, healthcare institutions. Um, so we use this place as a point of departure, as trying to really understand also on a practical level, what are the implications on when you do contracts, uh, what what happens when you actually uh, try to make the right decisions? If I buy this kind of diaper or this kind of diaper, which one is uh, is is most environmental friendly and seen from which kind of perspective? Which can be very difficult for just you can say a normal employee uh, to to actually see what are the right choices. And sometimes you don't even have the right choices because because there are not um, there are not made contracts with with uh, with suppliers who have the right um, um, you can say sustainable or circular products right so that is one thing that we are working with uh, together with them trying then to scale that up um, to to say okay one thing is to understand the practical level here at Sophia gone but taking that as as a whole looking at the whole municipality and the different institutions in the municipality and also uh, connecting that in a partnership with the whole region who has the um, they have the responsibility for hospitals in Denmark, which is the same problems you can say as we see here at Sofia gone so that the 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 input, the ideas and the prototypes that we are testing here can actually be used in a much broader sense uh, than only at Sofia gone. Then we have uh, Rema uh, which is a, a retail, it's a supermarket, and we have done a, quite a, a great job with them um, working on their value change on understanding how to create new circular loops for plastics in retail. And uh, and coming out of this is uh, is not only you can say like a very concrete process on how specific products at Rematusen can be sent into uh, new circular loops where we will, I mean, hopefully we will uh, succeed <laughs> on this, and that will mean a lot of, I mean, I don't, hundreds of ton of plastic going into recycling in instead of right now going to incineration. Um, so we are working concretely on that and at the same time looking at the methodology that we are using to do this as to say how can other retailers uh, benefit from, from this methodology and uh, in that sense we are in contact with them. Um, uh, with the national um, uh, government for environment to to together with them to you can say scale this uh, methodology 
up from from so again you can see maybe i hope like the same tendency that we are working very local micro local local you could even say but trying all the time to understand how we can scale up the solutions and use it in a, in a broader sense also after reflow um just shortly on our scenario uh, number three, this is uh, an apartment building where we work on how we can use, you can say like the community building that for people, they're like, well, we really want to just be together <laughs> and we don't really care much about sorting, but what is it actually about? So, so we have tried different angles as how can we also activate this uh, this community so through play through co-creation through music and different kinds of things it actually showed quite concrete concretely that if we take that point of departure will then it's not that difficult to get 70 people to come and discuss these kinds of things um, I could go broader into that, but I can see I only have one minute left. <laughs> so maybe if people have questions, you can we can take it up a bit later. Um, yes, we are here at the Spinnerihallerne, it's called. Uh, I, I work from here. This is our innovation hub in Weile. And from here also, we do a lot of citizens engagement and capacity building. We do exhibitions, we do workshops where people can get their hands into the material and together with the Fab Lab actually understand, OK, in, in another way, comprehending and understanding what is the circular economy and material actually about. So this is just to, to show you in the end, like what I've trying to, to show you through the examples that from the micro level to the more local Wiley city level and to the national level. And uh, together, of course, with all the, 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 um, uh, the people in, 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 um, in reflow, um, seeing how can we actually also use this on a more European level. We are here now in the middle of testing and uh, we will end in May 2022, hopefully with a, with a, a lot of great uh, results from our from our prototypes. Um, next up is finalizing these prototypes and uh, communicating our re, re, um, results in the exhibitions and uh, through the workshops, as I talked about in, in Fab Lab and, and Spinneri Hellene. So I think this was almost um, on time. Yes, it was. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> great. Yeah, you did great. Um, I, I did not want to cut off your, your, your flow because we started a little bit earlier and I thought it was, uh, it was very interesting what you had to say. But um, indeed, you're right on time. So um, and, and there are some questions uh, for you, but I think it's best to keep them uh, for the end um, when we'll have a discussion with, uh, with the wider group. Yes. Um, so thank you indeed for you, for your insights, and I'm happy that you mentioned that you were you talked about connecting people to each other, working on different levels, working on the systemic level and on an involving level uh, to have an inclusive and participatory approach. And I, I uh, fr from what I understand, at least circularity does not happen in a vacuum, and it's about actually closing a loop, uh, and and um, each stakeholder having a role to play. So. Um, uh, next on the chain, we have Simon Clement, uh, who will then give us the perspective of, uh, of local government. So we're going to zoom out a little bit from the micro level example that Vail, uh, municipality of Vaila has provided us. And we're going to look at um, uh, how local governments are approaching the issue of circularity. So I'm going to introduce uh, Simon Clement. Uh, who is the next speaker and Simon is actually a senior coordinator uh, for circular economy at ICLE, um, the uh, organization for local governments uh, on sustainability. So Simon leads ICLE Europe's activities in the fields of circular economy with 18 years of experience working in the sustainable economy and procurement team. He has coordinated numerous projects uh, projects and initiatives in the fields of sustainable and innovation procurement, circular economy and smart cities. His current and recent coordinated projects include City Loops, 
the big buyers for climate and environment initiative, uh, the Global Sit Lead City Network on Sustainable Procurement by ZET, uh, SPP Regions and Clean Fleet. So I'm not sure what each of these mean, but I will be looking to Simon um, to um, explain to us what exactly um, his, um, his uh, role is with ECLE and what the challenges of uh, um, lo the, the challenges that local governments are facing and what the opportunities are in um, making cities circular. So, Simon, welcome and over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Lise. Uh, I hope everybody can see my screen already with the presentation on there. Um, yes, I could I could bore you all for hours with uh, explanations about those different acronyms which you've just heard, but I think the most uh, relevant project that Lise mentioned there is City Loops. Um, which is an ongoing demonstration project in the field of circular economy and one of the sister projects uh, of Pop Machina, which is why we are here today and Reflow as well. Um, but the project focuses on two material streams, specifically the construction and demolition waste and also bio waste. So not directly plastics, um, although that of course does enter the discussions uh, with any city in the field of circularity. But my focus today is rather on why are cities important for the circular economy and turning that around on itself as well why is the circular economy important for cities as well um just quickly if i can make the screen work i can um just to introduce icle for those of you who don't know who we are so as Lise mentioned we are a global network um, of nearly 2,000 local and regional governments who are committed to sustainable urban development i'm working in the european secretariat in and in within within europe we have about 150 measures uh, members and circular economy is certainly something that is top of the priority list for many of those members as well and something that is increasingly uh, important for our members so let's just look at circularity and the city first of all but the starting point of course of this uh, these are sh figures that will shock nobody here um, is the fact that we have a systemic design flaw in the way that our global regional local economies uh, function um, there's an excellent report produced each year called the Circularity Gap Report by Circular Economy. Um, the report from 2019 showed that 62% of our global greenhouse emissions can be directly linked to the extraction, processing and manufacturing of goods. And of course, within our typical linear economy, uh, economy um, that means that these 62% of emissions are effectively thrown away at the end of that process. Now, back in 2019, uh, the report estimated that only 9% uh, of materials globally are reused. The most recent report suggests that that is actually trending downwards, not upwards. So there's a huge amount of work for us, of course, to do in this area. Um, what we're also starting to see, I think everybody is being affected this, by this now in our daily lives, is the fact that um, demand is outstripping supply of all types of different materials. Um, and this imbalance this gap is only increasing and will have a greater impact on what we're doing um, what this all means really is that we don't have any choice our need to transition to a circular economy is fundamental and this of course is something that cities and local governments themselves understand very clearly um, so why should we be working with cities some figures here that probably again most of you are familiar with um, a huge majority of our eu population lives in cities we consume an equally huge majority of our natural resources. Globally, over half of all waste is produced in cities uh, and 60 to 80 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions are produced in cities. So, of course, cities cannot be ignored within this context. Um, but on the other side, what we can also see, of course, is the cities are well placed to tackle this. In many ways, we can see that cities are cradles of innovation. Cities offer the possibility uh, for demonstration and experimentation at a, at a practical scale, exactly as the examples that Vela uh, have been presenting here. Um, and of course, the local governments and regional governments as well hold many key legislative and management functions um, that are required to be used in our attempts to promote um, the circular transition. Um, looking at that from the other angle, why are cities themselves interested in circularity? Why is this ben, uh, transition beneficial for cities? So why should local governments look at it? As presented already, we're living through a climate emergency and local governments are well aware of this. Cities themselves are placed to receive some of the highest burdens 
um, of the climate change crisis. Um, and so, of course, our local government and regional government representatives are responding to that. Um, we're not just talking about climate change, of course, we're talking about a biodiversity crisis, we're talking about air water pollution, we're talking about plastics collecting in our oceans. There are many different natural impacts, both happening globally, but also happening lo locally, um, that local governments and their voting publics want to be addressed. There are legislative requirements that are, of course, coming up shortly. Um, for example, the requirement from 2025 uh, to collect textile waste separately. These are all issues that local governments need to address. There's no choice. Um, and so, of course, addressing circularity, making this a beneficial process uh, is high on the agenda for, for local governments as well. Um, circu the circular economy uh, should ideally be an economy that is more resilient um, to global supply chain shocks. And again, this is something of key uh, current interest as we see all sorts of different um, supply shocks in our extremely complex uh, supply chains taking place. Um, what the circular, the circular economy also represents uh, in its best form is a new form of socio-economic uh, behaviour, a more socially just um, way of, of working, a way of behaving, a sharing cooperative economic model. Um, and finally, of course, um, from a purely economic angle, uh, the circular economy is one which should aim to boost local innovation and job creation, something that is being already uh, monitored and identified in cities across Europe and the world. Okay, what do we mean by a circular city? So this is, I'll come back to this slightly later, but this is something that we uh, looked at together with a group of other relevant parties um, around Europe to try to work out what a circular city actually is. We know that the concept of circular economy itself is uh, not really defined. At the city level, this is perhaps even more complex. Um, but from our side, we wanted to look at this as something that was related in its definition to the, the stakeholders and their activities themselves. So our starting point from this is a circular city is one of circular integration, where circular principles are applied across all city functions and in collaboration with all local stakeholders. A circular city is one that generates and retains value, where in innovative design and production methods, service-based business models and consumption behavior prioritize maintaining the value and utility of assets and products and materials. It's a city of closed loops, where products and materials are kept in use and waste and harmful resource use is minimized. But finally, and perhaps most importantly, a circular city is one is a livable city, one of low emissions, regenerated natural systems and improved human health and well-being. And this is all captured in the, the graphical display on the right hand side, indicating that our starting point for this is collaboration between the different stakeholders at the local level hopefully creating new business models and behavioral patterns that will lead to this closing of material loops and reducing harmful resource use but what we must always of course keep in mind is that this circular transition is not a means in its in itself it is a means to an end um, and that is in improving human well-being and improving environmental quality in line with the sdgs um, now what we could also see is that cities have a variety of different levers at their disposal for tackling uh, the circular economy or for promoting the circular economy rather and I can point you here to an excellent publication from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation on the different levers available for cities. They split this into five categories. Um, cities can provide a vision for circular economy so provide some sort of uh, framework to which stakeholders can agree um, a way forward for circularity for example through producing a, a local circular economy stra strategy and action plan. Um, cities, of course, are also excellent conveners of stakeholders at the local level. Um, so whether we're talking about arranging conferences, networking with local partners, whether we're talking about awareness campaigns in public space, um, whether we're talking about specific training for people either within the administration, within business or for citizens in general, cities have a key potential role to play in engaging the different stakeholders across uh, the, their territories. Cities, of course, also have very important specific urban management functions. If we're thinking about how spaces are designated for material transformation and recirculation, um, urban planning processes, waste management processes, obviously. Um, asset management, public authorities control or own a great deal of assets within the, the local uh, area. How we optimize the use of our public spaces and buildings is something key for the promotion of circularity. Public procurement, um, as Anna-Louise mentioned already, um, is a key tool in trying to promote a more 
circular based econo economic model, um, for example, through contracting services, um, services instead of uh, products, etc. Um, cities also have a role in providing economic incentives. Obviously, this is not only something that happens at the local level, but things such as innovation contests, hackathons, specific rebates, for example, can be very useful local tools uh, for combating particular issues. Fiscal measures such as taxation, again, obviously something that isn't only in the control of local governments, but there is a role to play. Finally, regulation as well. Um, again, regulation will primarily happen at the European national level, uh, but there are, of course, many multi uh, municipal ordinances that can have a big impact uh, on circularity. What we can also see, uh, of course, uh, is despite these obvious benefits of transitioning towards a circular economy, it's clearly not easy. And these are challenges that I don't think are going to be unfamiliar to any of you. First point, understanding the city's metabolism. So what really are these flows of materials that, that go around the cities? Where are the pressure points? What are the volumes? Who are the people involved? This is something that we don't necessarily traditionally have as local governments. Um, of course, we know that the regulatory and policy framework that is in place at the moment is primarily designed for the linear economy and presents key barriers towards circularity. Um, as we're talking about socio-economic behavioural change, um, what, we, what we're also talking about is the need to involve a great many different stakeholders, both internally and externally. Um, and while this, of course, is a very positive thing, it presents a big challenge um, for local governments. We know that there's a great deal of physical and mental inertia in the way that we all operate. And this is linked, to, of course, to the next point that, as mentioned, circular economy really requires a behavioural change. So a number of different uh, ways to address these points, as uh, Anne Louise already mentioned, getting political engagement right at the beginning of this process is, I think, fundamental for local uh, and regional authorities to work collaboratively. Um, involving all the different stakeholders in, in the activities which you are trying to present, understanding who those stakeholders are, what roles they have and different forms of participatory uh, involvement. Carrying out pilot actions, so making small tests Again, this is something that cities are very able to do um, and is something that's a very uh, positive tool. Um, carrying out metabolic studies, a number of cities are looking at uh, metabolism itself and trying to, as I say, understand where those different pressure points are within the city. And of course, networking, such as this event, such as ICLEI tries to promote as well in our other activities. Uh, there are a great many cities and regional authorities who are looking at very similar issues. So let's, of course, share what we're doing with each other. I'm sorry, Simon, you have yeah. a few minutes left. Five. I have a few minutes left. All right. OK, well, I'll try and rush through some of this. So just just to mention that, of course, there are now a number of different cities looking at uh, the circular economy. This is just a snapshot um, of some of the circular economy action plans that are being developed by cities. And of course, these are increasing daily uh, as cities recognise how important an area this is. I've listed here a few uh, specific projects that are working in the field of uh, plastics, um, including Bioplastics Europe, which has also established a, a network of historic cities against plastic waste. Um, there's Plasticity, looking at strategies for increasing uh, plastic waste recycling. I hope these presentations will be shared. There are links, of course, included in all of these. Plastic Circle. Uh, which tested innovations in collection, transporting and sorting of, of different plastic packaging in, in pilot cities. Um, and a network, Plastic Smart Cities, where cities in Europe and Southeast Asia are coming together to tackle this, this challenge as well. Uh, one quick example from a city that we've been working with is in Gumarish, which has been looking at, at, at tackling plastic since it signed the Plastic Free Declaration in 2019. Um, focusing on a number of different issues, such as uh, raising, raising awareness by passing out cloth bags to citizens and biodegradable plastic bags to market vendors, um, stopping the use of single plastics within their own municipal functions, distributing glass water bottles to, to students at the university and schools, um, and also developing uh, specific trash collection eco barriers for rivers and drains where they were discovering that there was a lot of plastic waste in their own environment. Um, and transforming these into new products. I have several slides here presenting uh, different actions that cities are doing in different fields, but I won't go through these now given the time we have. Looking at citizen engagement and entrepreneurship, looking at the, the buildings and construction sector, 
for example, looking at the food and bio waste sectors, these two sectors representing really strong priorities for public authorities. But if, if you look at the presentation afterwards, you can see a number of examples in here. Uh, I want to also mention the European Circular Cities Declaration. This is something that we developed at the beginning of the City Loops process together with a whole series of strategic partners, um, including Ellen MacArthur, including Eurocities, Circle Economy, European Investment Bank, um, and many others, as you can see listed on this screen here, um, to develop a, a political declaration which would allow local and regional governments to communicate their commitment to supporting this transition across Europe. What it also presents is the definition which I provided earlier um, and it's designed to underscore the role that cities and regional governments play in this transition to a circular economy. We currently have uh, 59 signatories, I think it might be 60 from today um, and you can find more information on the website there. And it would be great, of course, if some of those joining us today would like to join this long list of cities um, who have already signed up, cities and regions. Okay. I won't spend much time on this, but again, if you look at the presentation afterwards, there's quite a bit of guidance already out there for cities on how they can apply the principles of circularity within their own activities. Four guidebooks here um, that you can see from the Commission, from the European uh, Investment Bank, from C40, uh, from the CSCP Centre, all very useful tools. Um, and here's a link, here's a set of links to a number of very useful websites also active in the field. I think I can stop there. Thank you, Simon. So we started with a concrete case study uh, where we had a look at it. Um, concrete example uh, in, in, in Violet. And we had a look at the perspective of local authorities with Simon and uh, I'm very grateful for such a complete overview of uh, what needs to be done, what opportunities and challenges exist. Um, and I really encourage everyone um, with us today to have a closer look at the presentation um, as the examples of uh, best practices that you just shared um, look very interesting as well. So now it's time to hear from, um, from uh, an industry expert. And I'm happy to welcome uh, the next speaker, who is Nicholas Budak. And Nicholas is the Director General at UNESDA. And UNESDA is the organization representing the European soft drinks industry. So Nicholas, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much, Lise. Great. So, um, I'll just say a few words about about your work. Um, you are working with 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 UNESCO, advancing the EU soft drinks sustainable, responsible, and agenda. Uh, so, before joining UNESCO, you were working with the EU government and regulatory affairs. Um, at IBM, and um, you were also um, uh, in leadership positions with Ford and General Motors, um, and also did some work with the American Chamber of Commerce uh, for, to the EU. So you have a lot of uh, corporate and industry experience, and I am happy to um, hear more about your work and um, your presentation. I'm sorry I had a bit of a battery problem just now. But um, all yours over Great. to you. Thank you very much, uh, Lise. And again, also like uh, like previous speakers, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here with you, and I'll share with you a few slides. Um, you know, it's 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 these type of events uh, that uh, that we need because it's it's this dialogue um, with uh, local communities, with innovators, that will help us achieve what Simon spoke about is the transition to a circular economy. Um, so, uh, so very much happy to be here uh, with you. Um, I'll share a presentation, a few slides, and uh, it's it's always great to uh, to come after distinguished speakers like uh, like Anne Louise and uh, like uh, like Simon, because I can then build uh, build on that. I hope you can see my slides. Okay, great. Um, Okay, so um, so I said, you know, I think um, I would like to build on what uh, Simon said about we don't have a choice. Uh, we need to transition. 
Um, and that is exactly the, uh, the situation we are in. And uh, to achieve this transition, it will require both a top-down approach, but also a bottom-up approach. And I think this bottom-up approach uh, is uh, unfortunately, you know, here in Brussels, where we focus on EU uh, policy making, is very much forgotten. Uh, because Simon alluded to the, the need for behavioral change. Um, what we are talking about is a transition that is going to be a real transformation, a real transformation for many of us. And, and with transformation comes challenges and, you know, with challenges, you know, also come opportunities. And so, um, you know, I think one of the uh, the biggest uh, challenges and opportunities we have is to indeed focus on um, on how we can change the behavior that all of us have as citizens and as consumers. But that doesn't say, obviously, that you know we as the corporate industry obviously have a big responsibility um, to drive that change. And I'm and that's why I'm very happy to share with you some of the the thoughts that we have put together on on how we will be taking our responsibility. Um, very briefly, uh, just very quickly to just uh, share with you a, a few reminders on, on who we are. So as, as Lee said, we are the uh, European Association representing the soft drinks, soft drinks industry with members uh, like Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Red Bull, Suntory, Nestle, Danone, uh, but also a lot of national associations. Um, so uh, it also gives us the, the national angle uh, and the local angle, which is extremely important. And we have existed since many years. Um, I haven't been around that long with the association. I joined uh, almost two years ago. Uh, but as was uh, also said by Simon, you know, the policy environment, the legislative environment is extremely important. And when it comes to um, to legislation, you know, we do know that, you know, 75 percent of legislation is now um, originated in, 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 in Brussels. But then at the end of the day, it's the national governments, the cities, the regions that, you know, help implement this. So, so that angle is extremely important for us. So um, sustainability is driving a, 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 a real debate on the food system of tomorrow. Um, and I, I, I picked a, a picture that some of you might have, might have seen uh, of uh, last year. You know, we obviously, unfortunately, have uh, have witnessed the the terrible uh, effects of uh, the COVID pandemic, which was then reinforced by a, an economic uh, recession. But the wave coming behind that is um, the wave of climate change, and I think it's important to put that into perspective because the pandemic and the recession should not be an excuse for ignoring the climate change wave wave or the biodiversity collapse. Um, we cannot ignore that, that we have to change. Now, we can obviously have a discussion about how that change happens, how that transition happens, but the change has to happen because climate change, whether we like it or not, is happening. And so within Europe, we're, we're going through a very challenging debate around uh, the future food system. Um, focused around three pillars, a, a social sustainability, an environmental sustainability, and an economic sustainability. And, and we as a soft drinks, ident uh, soft drinks in this industry identify ourselves as, 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 as having our responsibility in a number of areas here, whether it goes from you know, making sure that we have healthier diets and reducing overweight, to what we will be discussing today, you know, how do we protect the environment, how do we tackle climate change, and how do we develop a circular economy? Building on this, um, you know, um, at the beginning of this new commission, um, the Commissioner for Environment presented uh, his new vision for a circular economy action plan. And so I stole a few uh, a few headlines from uh, from that plan, which I think you know summarize extremely well the transition that we are in. And um, we're talking about first, you know, we are faced with a, as was alluded to before, a reality is that the consumption of plastics continues to increase and is expected to double in the next in the next 20 years. Now. Uh, a positive thing is that you know Europe, with 
uh, single-use plastics directive has acted on this with uh, a, a lot of single-use plastic products being phased out. And for other products, like for beverage bottles, uh, requirements to um, to achieve a certain level of collection. Um, but packaging, you know, packaging which we all use on a daily basis, which helps us um, uh, from uh, on on tremendously. But packaging um, is reaching um, uh, record uh, record levels. Um, and also here, you know, we are having a a, a uh, uh, a reflection and a discussion on how do we transition from from some of this packaging which is single use to packaging which is reusable and also again something that was discussed before and then at the end of the day i mean you know the problem of waste um it's it's something which which is extremely unfortunate um, i think here in belgium and and Anne louis spoke about you know coming from sweden you know, we have certain countries that have demonstrated that we can tackle the concept of the problem of waste. We have solutions to do so. What requires us is now to implement those solutions. And so, um, and that's why I'm extremely uh, optimistic about, uh, because we have proven solutions, um, whether it's Sweden or other countries, that show that we can address uh, waste collection and, and increased recycling. So as I said, we from industry have a responsibility. And that's why uh, last, well actually six months ago, we from UNESDA representing the soft drinks industry, so major companies like Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Red Bull, etc. have presented a vision for achieving a fully circular packaging by 2030. And I will share with you some, some more details of this vision. Why are we doing this? Because we want to present our contribution to accelerating this transition to a circular economy. We have to accelerate and it requires people taking their responsibility and we are doing so. But it also allows us to, to demonstrate something and I think this is something that um, unfortunately, it's very often forgotten in, in, this, in the discussion around environment and, and waste is that at the end of the day, packaging has value. Yes, unfortunately, we see it much too often end up as waste, but fundamentally packaging has value and we need to make sure that it is fully recyclable, it is fully collected and then is reused as recycled content. Now, that doesn't mean that we obviously have to reduce the amount of packaging. Yes, we also have to do that, but packaging has value. It should never end up as waste or never end up as litter. And so what we are doing with this vision is that we want to engage in a dialogue with stakeholders. We have set out our uh, commitments, and I'll, I'll go into more detail, but obviously to get there, it will require a collective effort. There are a lot of things that are within our power and we will do that, but there are a number of other things that will require collective effort. Uh, building on that are the um, are three core pillars. The, the pillars of collection, recycling, and reducing and reusing. I think when you, when you talk about the circular economy, whether it's in Brussels, in Sweden, wherever, you will always see these pillars come back and back again. Collection, recycle, reduce and reuse. So what is it that, um, that we have committed to do? And, and um, I'm very proud of this because many of these commitments, if not all, go well beyond existing legal requirements. So we have really taken a responsibility that we believe that you know, if you really want to accelerate, you need to go beyond existing um, requirements. So, by 2025, um, we have committed that we will achieve a 50% recycled content for our plastic packaging. The European requirements for 2025 are 25%. So we will go well beyond that. And we will also commit to make sure that our packaging is 100% recyclable. There are no uh, requirements to achieve that, but obviously, if you want to achieve circularity, the foundation of circularity is recyclability. 
And so we are committing to make sure that our packaging will be 100% recyclable by 2025. Already today, more than 90% of our packaging is uh, fully recyclable. And then we're taking a step um, forward. In 2030 or by 2030, we will make sure that 90% of, of all of our packaging is collected. And I would like to stress the word all because indeed we have mandatory targets on single-use plastics, on beverage bottles, a 90% collection target by 2029. But what we are committing is that all of our packaging, so including aluminium and glass, that we will achieve a minimum 90% uh, collection. We will then also commit by then, by 2030, to achieve 100% use of recycled uh, material, either our pet or, and or renewable pet, in our packaging. Again here, going well beyond EU requirements, the EU is requiring us to do 30%, we are going to go fully circular and do 100%. And then in addition, I, I mentioned the, the pillar of reduce and reuse. Uh, for today, we are, we are making a commitment that we are going to increase the use of refillable packaging. And, and you might have recently also seen the announcement by PepsiCo with SodaStream, which is expanding its offering. And uh, we are not yet committing to specific targets because we want to first assess what is the best environmental and socioeconomic pathway to achieve more refillable. So we are going to use more refillable, but before committing to a, a quota, we want to make sure that we, it is done in the right way. The, okay. Yes, yes. I will, I will finish now um, with, uh, with a, final, a final slide. Just uh, to stress what, what Simon also has been saying is the need for a, a, a framework, a policy framework, that will, have, uh, that will be required to support us in doing this. Uh, and I'm happy to go into more details during the Q&A, but I think here are two fundamental issues I would like to, uh, to make. One, we need a long-term policy framework. And number two is that we need to make sure that when it comes to waste collection and recycling, we have increased investment in achieving that. Thank you very much, uh, Lise. Thank you, Nicholas. So um, we are at the end of the first segment of presentations and I'm uh, uh, excited for the next segment, which is our discussion. Um, we've heard from um, various sides of the, the problems and the solutions around circularity. Um, and uh, one thing that um, really comes to mind for me is that indeed, the, the closing of the loop will take action from all stakeholders. So I'm happy that we're here with actors from the industry sector, from uh, local authorities, and an actual um, municipality leading action and then taking action on the change we want to see in terms of circularity in cities. Uh, I'm going to ask Anne a question that was asked for uh, during her presentation, um, and I'm just going to pull it up. So are the results of Viola's strategy showing in the statistics? Do you have a higher recycling rate of plastic waste than other Danish cities, or low, lower total amount of plastic waste, or other measurable outcomes? Please get back to me in February. <laughs> because that's when we will do the measurement but but hopefully yes <laughs> but i don't have the numbers yet uh, we did the first measuring uh, in the beginning of the project and then we will measure of course the same in the same way uh, now in the end around february so i will have the results then Very, um, but if, if you'd like to share also something about measurement and what indicators you're looking at uh, yeah. in terms of uh, yeah, measuring impact, I think. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I can try and do that. Uh, well, again, we, we, um, we take um, part of, I mean, we, we look into the concrete test sites, right? Um, so, for example, one of the things that we are measuring is, um, as I also told you in the examples, the 
how can you measure on better sorting? Well, you, you look at the residual waste and see, OK, did any <laughs> amount of plastic actually move from this residual waste into the to the right plastic bins, right? So it's a, a very concrete way, you can say, of uh, of measuring this 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 movement. Also, of course, you can look in the other fractions. Um, Right now in Denmark, there's a new uh, legislation. Actually, it should be implemented already, but a lot of municipalities are not ready for it yet. Uh, but that means that everyone needs to sort into 10 different fractions, um, no matter if they are a public institution or if they are a private company or if they are citizens. So, so you can say our, also our focus on this whole sorting problem and that goes for, as you probably already know, all of you, that it's not only uh, um, an issue on plastic, but also on carton and paper and glass and all of that. So the better, the the more clean uh, fractions you have, the more uh, uh, the the higher recycling process you 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 can also uh, adapt. So. So it's a it's a thing that's very much on the loop right now, both in Vile, but also generally in, uh, in on a national level. So we don't you can say if, if I should just come back to the measurement part, um, we will not be able within reflow to measure on, you can say, like on a city level. What we can do is is, is say, OK, if we have these small test sites and we have these results, how will it look? when we over the next years, within the next five to 10 years, scale this up, yeah. then how does it look? So, so that's also a part of our, of our measurement, you can say, but that will be like not concrete numbers that we know now, but a way of, of actually seeing it scaled broader up, yeah. So that's one way. And then the, the other thing we are measuring concretely with, as I told you about the uh, Rematusen, where we, um, we have these specific plastic uh, products or items that we are looking into, for example, um, a candy box and some flower bins and stuff like this, which is right now a sent to incineration. And, and that is quite, quite easily to, to look at, OK, we do this for, for one store, but at the same time, we are already uh, doing like uh, looking at the logistics within Rematus and they have 365 stores just in Denmark. So all, already doing the logistics for all of these stores as to how can this be collected also in a way where we don't then do uh, a bad impact on CO2 and transport and logistics. <laughs> because that's, I mean, that is what I think is the hard thing about measurement. Because if you just say, OK, we want to decrease plastic and only looking at that, then it can have quite different implications. And so what the other speakers also said about this thing that it's not made in a vacuum. I think maybe it was you, Liz, saying that it's, it's, you need the whole like value chain to understand that. So, yeah. so yeah. jump yeah. in. The other speakers are also nodding along. So it, it yeah. is a discussion. Feel yeah, it is. To, to jump yeah. In. So, yeah. Um, they Go ahead, so, Simon. Go yeah, ahead. could I could I add to that as well? Then? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, I just want to emphasize what Anne Louise said there at the end um, about the need for us not just to monitor these uh, very direct, very physical uh, changes to to the to the metabolic flows within cities, but to monitor the the, the wider impacts of, of what those are as well. This is what we we're, we're trying to do this within the City Loops project to put together an evaluation framework for the measures, uh, which of course looks at these issues regarding um, waste generation, waste separation, etc., uh, but also the socio-economic and environmental impacts of what they're doing. And before that, looking at uh, monitoring uh, the uh, activities of the different stakeholders as well. So trying to and, and what that how that impacts on specific uh, business models within the process. So you somehow need to be monitoring all of these in order to see the collections, the connections between them. Um, but it's also something that is being addressed at the European level. There are many different groups looking at indicators and monitoring frameworks for circular economy. There was an excellent study done by the Urban Partnership on Circular Economy um, and something that the Commission themselves will hopefully be addressing within what they're launching soon, which is the Circular Cities and Regions Initiative as well. So this is something and it's important for us to be able to be collaborating on this by using similar metrics across different cities and different regions and different countries as well. Uh, to avoid fragmentation there. 
Yeah, Liz, if I may also, uh, and, and first of all, and Louise, very sorry that I referred to Sweden when I spoke about you. I should have referred, obviously, to Denmark. <laughs> no um, problem. Be, being one third Dane, Dane myself, that's a terrible mistake um, I made. Um, so um, I wanted to, to follow up on, on two things that uh, that Anne Louise said. Uh, first, uh, at the very end, on the uh, the environmental footprint. I think that this is indeed something that we need to monitor extremely carefully um, because there is indeed a, a very strong focus now on reducing, reducing and reusing and reusing and, and you have to reduce and yes, you have to reuse and, and, and have more reuse systems. But we have to also make sure that it's done in the right way, that we are not shifting the problem because, um, you know, reusing brings with it additional logistics, addition, additional quality, additional Washington, uh, washing, etc. And so, for you know, we always say that, you know, please, when you introduce new requirements like this, you know, make sure that you have done a proper life cycle assessment. And this is something that actually, you know, we find extremely problematic in some countries around Europe where there's a big focus on, on reducing and, 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 and introducing reuse quota. But when we ask them, have you made the environmental analysis uh, of this? The answer is very often no. So, so it's, uh, it's dangerous. We have to be very careful about that. And the other thing I wanted to uh, address that, and Louis said, and this uh, relates to a question that's addressed to me by Siegfried. And Louis spoke about clean streams. I think you know one of the advantages that we have for beverage bottles, um, and really I speak now for beverage bottles, is that Denmark, Scandinavia, the Baltic countries, we have deposit return schemes. So we have a, 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 a specific waste collection scheme that has been created for beverage bottles that allows you to really create a clean stream to make sure that you know the bottle stays within the stream. And then Sigrid, to your point, you know, it is recycled, but then it's also fully recycled because it is within that same stream. And so that's why we are promoting such deposit return schemes much more widely around Europe, because we believe that they offer a lot of a lot of advantage uh, to address concerns that might be about how much are we actually recycling of our waste? Well, when it comes to when you have a deposit return system, you can guarantee that you know, you, more than 90% is being collected and then, maybe, you know, a, almost everything of that is then being recycled and, and reused in, as, as, as new bottles. Um, so I just wanted to address uh, that point also by, by Sigrid. Sigrid. Thank you, Nicholas. I just want to go quickly to Chris Backus, uh, who is a, an attendee who has uh, his hand up. So I assume there's a question there, although I want to remind and encourage everyone to uh, use the chats function for the questions. Uh, Chris, did you have a question for our panel? Yes, thanks very much, uh, Liz. Actually, my, uh, my comment or question is uh, directly in response to what uh, Nicholas just said. That's why I uh, decided to raise my hand instead of writing in the chat. Uh, so I was, I was quite uh, pleased with your support for deposit uh, return systems. Uh, uh, right now, you may know that uh, in Belgium, we, we do not uh, have that system in Flanders. Uh, there's quite some opposition, uh, political opposition against it. Uh, I think all the countries that surround us all have these systems for plastic uh, drinking bottles. Uh, and uh, uh, it's my observation that the, the packaging uh, sector in Belgium is not really uh, supporting uh, the idea. Uh, so you said you and your organization are supporting it. So do, are we looking at local differences here? Do you think your uh, position is like representative for the packaging uh, sector throughout Europe? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, good to have a fellow Belgian uh, on the call. Um, so the um, in Belgium, but also in, in a few other countries, they have already a very well established uh, extended producer recycle uh, responsibility scheme, and then we have our famous blue bag scheme here in uh, in, in Belgium, and the, the system is showing that it it can achieve extremely high rates of collection, Chris, um, and um, you know is not far from achieving the European uh, mandatory targets of 90%. Already today, it's at above 80%. So it is correct that there are. Uh, a handful of countries around Europe where existing uh, schemes are proving to be extremely efficient. 
Um, and so, you know, I think one needs to evaluate how would a deposit return scheme then fit within such a within such an existing scheme. Um, but I think, you know, what is important is that, you know, in, in situations like in Belgium, but also in a few other countries, we're talking about schemes that have existed for many, many, many years. So they are very well established within the consumer uh, citizens uh, behavior. But again, thank you very much for raising it. Um, and indeed, there are a few differences around Europe, but we are working with all authorities to assess what is the um, uh, what is the best uh, the best option. And in our mind, um, as I said, you know, DRS is showing that it's it's extremely positive. Uh, but at the same time, you know, um, the system in Belgium that you refer to is already showing also a very good, uh, very good, uh, very good schemes. I think for me, Chris, the bottom line is we have to achieve high levels of collection very quickly. And there are some countries that are doing extremely badly when it comes to collection. And we have no time to waste. And in those countries, you know, we would encourage introducing a deposit return scheme because we have seen that in a matter of three, four or five years, you can go from 30% collection to 90% collection. Um, so yes, I mean, in, you know, there are a lot of countries that definitely should be shifting to a deposit return scheme. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, I have a question for you again from Ben. Um, so this is in the chat. And uh, so Ben says, is your association also looking at encouraging producers to use larger packaging size? For instance, for mineral water in the USA, the use of 19 liter bottles is very common, not so in Germany. Why do we produce so many small bottles in the first place? Well, thank you very much. And I mean, there are, there are a number of reasons uh, for that. Obviously, I mean, as you know, I mean, soft drinks being carbonated. So, you know, you have the challenge of always opening, closing, opening, closing, and then losing uh, some some form of the carbonation. So it's very extremely difficult to compress mineral water with a soft drink when it comes to big sizes. In addition, I'm not sure it would be extremely popular if suddenly we, uh, you know, uh, you know, soft drinks would be sold in 20 liter uh, uh, packaging sizes um, in supermarkets, etc. Um, but I think, you know, the reality is also that, you know, um, we are re responding to a consumer reacting, uh, consumer, and uh, you know, the consumers are increasingly interested in small bottles. Um, and that also allows for moderate consumption. Um, so that is also something that you know one needs to uh, one needs to uh, keep in mind. So that's why we are very much focused on uh, pack size reduction and using these uh, these small bottles. Okay, that seems uh, clear. And once again, if the other panelists have um, thoughts on the issue, feel free to also also contribute. One thing that came to my mind as we were talking, Nicholas, was um, uh, I was I was wondering uh, if, you know, um, this approach from the industry of uh, tailoring to consumer needs can also somehow be reversed. And if the industry also has a role in in shaping uh, consumer behaviors with new um, new consumption patterns. No, definitely, as I said, we have definitely responsibility, but that's where the where that's where the partnership with with Simon and with Anne Louise are so important because, you know, um, obviously yes, representing uh, big companies, um, you know, we do have a certain cloud or influence that we can have on 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 consumers, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, it's 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 a joint a joint partnership. So we are we are doing our our share in, you know, whether it is educating consumers on circularity. You will have seen, you know, many of our members that, you know, have do advertising around the importance of recycling. Uh, those of you based here in Belgium will have seen over the last months, you know, big, big posters around the importance of recycling. Um, we are also uh, doing a lot of education with schools. Um, with schools, with local communities around Europe, around the importance of, of of sustainability, and then when it comes to consumption, yes, I mean, you know, we uh, we have made certain commitments around a moderate consumption of soft drinks, 
um, reducing the sugar in our drinks, not advertising to certain um, uh, categories of of uh, of, uh, of people like like children, not selling in in schools, etc. But we cannot neglect also the role of parents. I mean, you know, I think you know, there's it's about, it's also a lot about education. So yes, we have our responsibility. I do not deny this, but we cannot be the sole responsible. Um, it, it has to be a partnership with uh, with everybody, whether it's the parents, the schools, the municipalities, etc. Lise, can I can I maybe come in on that point as well? Um, because yeah, I mean, I think that emphasizes again what we what we've all been talking about the need of of, the, of all of the different stakeholders to be involved in those processes. So when we're designing a an effective collection system. I don't think it's the case that we can say the, what works here will definitely work there. Um, it's a much more complicated process than that, also including related to relating to culture as well. Um, so that's why the importance of involving all levels of government, involving uh, the industry, the suppliers, involving retailers, but also involving um, citizens and citizen groups in designing the most effective process is really um, critical in that, I would say. Um, but another point to mention here, we're, we're just talking about the collection process within this. Um, what of course is key in that is that we also need to look at what happens afterwards. We need to th focus on what happens with the pl plastic that is being collected and recycled um, and what sort of potential value there is to that. Um, and that is where an even bigger challenge lies for all of us, I think. I mean, if we're talking about fully closed loop systems where that goes back into the production chains of those who are making the products that use plastic and plastic packaging in the first place, we've got a perfect system. But of course, that um, not all plastic is going to be in that environment. So we need to be looking at what can we do with the with what's left, what's left over. Um, and there, there are enormous number of interesting different initiatives and uh, uh, projects that are going on, creating new products using recycled plastics, et cetera, which I think is really where an important focus needs to be laid because everything up until that point is talking about something that costs money. Right. And now we here we're talking about something that could potentially earn money as well. Okay. And um, something that actually made me think of... Uh, of you, Simon, is the, um, the the comment in the chat about um, the advantage of a deposit return system, which um, can also contribute to solving littering problems. Uh, and I just thought back about your slides and all of the examples that you had of best practices of cities um, fixing the problems of littering and, and, and waste and plastic pollutions. And I was wondering if you could, could um, comment or provide at least some concrete examples of what cities are, are doing with regards to littering and possibly um, what systems they have in place for, for, for um, waste uh, collection. I think I'd have to come back to you with some concrete examples on that, Lisa. I don't have them off the top of my head. I could, what I could point you to, um, is the Circular Cities Declaration website, where each of the signatories has a page on what they are doing in these different areas. Um, but I think the point that Chris makes is is a really strong one, um, that the that littering in our cities, and again, very different in different countries that we have. But this is something that local governments and local voters find mm. a very important issue. Um, so it's not just about the, the the economic model behind it and the circularity. We're talking about the standard, uh, the quality of life. I did uh, mention the 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 Guimaras example in, from Portugal, uh, where they're specifically looking at how they can themselves collect plastic from their wider environment and use that as well, because they're the existence of plastic in the city, um, waste plastic is an issue. So this is not just something that happens in on distant uh, Pacific beaches, etc. as we see pictures all the time. It's actually a real problem within the cities within Europe as well. And, and can I just please just to build on that? I mean, um, for, for those of us who, who have children, it starts at an early age. I mean, you know, and, and um, I've, I've made I've made that experience with my uh, with one of my sons who's four and a half years old turned out to actually be a bit of a mistake but I've you know I've, I've educated him on the importance of, of of recycling plastics you know and and but telling a story to him which is that you know the recycled the plastic that you will collect and you'll put in the bin will then be reused 
to to build the little trains that uh, that you will get for 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 Santa Claus, etc. So now he goes around in you know, collecting all plastic, which is great. The other th the only problem is that he expects me to always buy trains for him. Uh, but um, but it's great to see that you know if you build a story around this already at a very young age, you can really motivate um, children to uh, in a fun way to be part of circularity. It doesn't have to be a burden. It can be something which is fun to do. Can I, yeah, I totally agree. What a nice story, Nicholas. <laughs> I could see my, my sons in, in that story as well. <laughs> but um, uh, maybe just to, to elaborate a bit on that, because I didn't have so much time to talk about the Den Gamle Go, which is an apartment building here in the west of Weile. And, and where we have exactly um, used this way of, of communicating as well, telling stories, making games, um, for example, like, okay, how long time does it take for this kind of plastic or this kind of material? If you put it into nature, when does it disappear? And then they have to put up between like two trees, <laughs> uh, the number of years and, and uh, like a sorting game system as well, where both actually, and that was fun to see because we actually developed it for kids, but there were a lot of adults as well going to this game and then and they did it all wrong. <laughs> I mean, and, and they were surprised that they did it wrong. I mean, they thought actually that they were sorting the waste correctly. So there's still like a huge amount of work to do on, on that part. And if I, I, I don't have an overview over waste collection w within different countries or cities, but just to, to add on the complexity on that is that, for example, in Denmark, maybe it's the same in, in other countries as well. It's like, okay, so we have, um, of course, like a common rule set and legislation for the, for the, for on a national level, right? But besides that, it's actually up to the municipality. They can decide which ways they want to collect the waste and they can actually also still decide even with the new legislation with the 10 uh, fractions that i talked about they can still decide if they want to for example uh, combine plastic with um, with uh, with metal because in the in the after um what do you say like after it is um um yeah, well, after it leaves the city, uh, it, it can be it can be um, separated, right? And so if we have that kind of, of workflow, it's actually OK. But the problem is if you are a citizen and I live now in Weile, but then I move to Aarhus or Copenhagen, then the sorting is completely different, maybe. And I don't understand as a citizen why I in like uh, in my working place, why sort it in one way? And then another place when I go uh, to a conference or I'm in my private home, I need to do it in another way. So the idea of the 10 fractions were in the beginning like an attempt to streamline it all so that you knew, OK, no matter if you are an institution or in a company or you are at your home, it's the same goddamn thing you need to do. <laughs> But the, but then the I mean everything turned upside down because the whole like flow of work that are in the different municipalities are not ready to do this fragmentation and they don't have the right equipment they don't have the right transportation they don't have the right I mean so it was not possible so it's still up to the single municipality to decide how they will collect it. Besides that, there's like a group of municipalities uh, in an island called Fyn, who are, it is, uh, I don't, I'm not really sure that they said yes to it yet, but the idea is that they actually want to, um, uh, to, to do an experiment where they are able to put all kinds of waste streams together in just one bin. Not the not the organic, but everything else in one bin, and then see if it is actually possible with robotics and stuff like to to sort it afterwards, so that it is not on us as citizens to do the to do the sorting. Mm. So that just confuses when I talk to people that confuses them like even more. So is it important or is it not important? So we have a, I think a huge. Um, 
um, task here to how can we how can we even communicate about this very complex thing because it's simple when you say oh if you put plastic here then it will be a train and everyone can see that but then if they really dive into it, it's like well will it really not no not all kinds of plastic and if you live in this municipality it's a little bit different and and that kind of blurs the picture right and I, I don't have the answer for this but it could be interesting to hear if anyone has ideas on on how to really um yeah talk about this field without confusing people even more does anyone have any answers to this, uh, this scaling and harmonization uh, issue? I mean, the, the way I'm hearing it is that the, 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 there is a problem even from the start, and then it ends up it, bigger at the end, right? It, it, is, it, it is something that the EU is actually looking into. So the European Commission is going to be uh, proposing uh, uh, rules to harmonize uh, sorting and collection. So, um, so it's... Uh, whether or not they will achieve in doing so is a different story, but indeed the EU has identified this as, as Anne Louise said about as one of the um, one of the barriers, um, given that the movement within a country but also among countries. So a proposal is expected. Um, I, I don't remember if it's next year or the or the year after. And do you think that um, the uh, that basically? Putting the, it seems at least that the burden ends up on the smallest scale of um, of um, public decision making, which is the cities. But do you think that deciding at a higher level, um, not nationally but even at the EU level, do you think that that will be the most efficient approach to to then reduce the burden and reduce that level of confusion that people that citizens face? I think that um, it's it's difficult to answer that question, Lise, to be honest. It, I think it depends what we're talking about. Um, if we go back to the discussion we had about deposit return schemes, something that we are promoting together with uh, some friends in the industry is that the EU should at the minimum have minimum requirements on what a deposit return scheme should look like. Because we're having discussions around around Europe and at the end of the day, we need to make sure that they are well designed so the EU could intervene and say, well, you know, if you do a deposit return scheme, here are the minimum requirements that you should mm -hmm. adhere to. Just to make sure that what is done at the end of the day has some at least limited form of similarity or harmonization. Um, when it comes to this collection, I think that will, remains to be seen because we're talking about something which is entrenched already in 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 habits. So um, you know, let's see how those discussions go, and you know, maybe it's possible with you know with providing a certain lead time. I think one thing we also should not forget, and you know, as we are talking about giving information to consumers, is that you know we are all consumers, but we can also only absorb as much information as we can. So you know, you don't want your package to be filled with three, four or five different labels that confuses you. Um, so for instance, you know, in a, in a country like Denmark that has a deposit return scheme, it's very, for beverage bottles, the only thing one really needs is to know that it's part of the deposit return scheme. You don't necessarily need to confuse consume with other type of information. The consumer just needs to know that it's part of the scheme and needs to be put back into the scheme. So I think that that's why we're also suggesting that one should use digital means, you know, QR codes, etc., so that if you want to give more information, don't necessarily put it on the label on the package, but then you know allow the consumer to somehow use a, a mobile device to um to 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 look at that information. Just to, again to 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 avoid an overload of information with consumers. Um, Lisa, if I may. Yeah, so on the point of European standardization, I mean, I think in, in, in obviously in principle, something like this would would have a very positive impact to make to, to provide some sort of certainty and similarity for both citizens, but also for the companies at the other end of that, that, that chain as well, in terms of the type of material streams that they're getting. But the reality is that the um, waste processing uh, 
systems and facilities that are in place in different cities and regions of Europe are very, very different. And so what is possible to do in one region can't necessarily be done in another. And these are, of course, also expensive pieces of uh, infrastructure. So the, the wonderful idea that we would have one bin, we throw everything in there, and then some clever machine can itself identify all the different fractions and sort it out is, is a goal that we would all dream of. But I think for, for most of Europe, of course, this is a very long way off. So the reality is there would need to be some form of uh, assessment of what is the most effective way in this region of ultimately ensuring that that um, material is then available for reuse afterwards. So that's the, the ultimate goal here, that we are collecting and making those materials available for reuse. On, on standardization, there's another important point in this discussion regard, regards uh, terminology. So this point about recyclable, recycled, but also then thinking about biodegradable, compostable, for example, which in the plastics industry is a really, really important point. I know very well here in, in Freiburg in southern Germany, we have biodegradable plastic bags that we are, can buy in the shops and put in our, in our, in our compost bins, um, feeling very good about ourselves. But our local waste company in, in the uh, system that it has to, to uh, get rid of those bins, they won't biodegrade because they don't have the right facilities. Um, and this again is a question of terminology. And that's that's very confusing for consumers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Simon. I have to apologize to Nikolaus because he has had his hand up for a while. Um, but I just wanted to pass the mic over to, to Nikolaus for his question. To yeah, uh, don't worry about it. So it's uh, most of other people participating. So I just have uh, a question I've been hearing uh, all of you and uh, I've heard Simon talking about the um, value chains uh, from waste collection down to recycling and uh, so on. And I've also heard uh, Nicolas talking about uh, the deposit schemes and uh, reusable packaging in the future. And although uh, we do have very uh, good examples of startups, uh, let's say in the reusable packaging loop in the US is uh, one such example. Other grassroots innovations, uh, grassroots innovations, and uh, you know, very early stage startup which need access to waste are excluded because the waste streams are uh, usually contracted by major recycling companies. So, how do you see the support for this kind of grassroots innovation being, you know, having access to raw materials and uh, being able to offer solutions? Thank you. I, uh, I'll have a first go at that. Thank you very much for that question. Um, so, so again, speaking when it comes to, to beverage bottles, um, where we have as the beverage bottle industry, um, mandatory collection targets, mandatory recycled content targets, and also EU requirements on the type of food grade quality that we have to use in our packaging. And so one of the things that we are therefore saying is that um, as we are, and it comes back to what Simon was discussing, as we are creating these closed loops, the food grade quality material that is being used for food packaging should in the first place be offered to those that are operating in remaking food grade quality packaging. And if there are leftovers, then this should go to, to others. The reason for that is that once you downcycle by using the, 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 the packaging, the plastic packaging, for instance, into putting it into a bumper or, or something else, you cannot upcycle it again. You've lost its, its quality. And so, um, so what we are suggesting is that, you know, that there is indeed a challenge of access because increasing number of um, companies are announcing their intention to go circular and, and use, more use more recycled content. And I gave my example about the trains, etc. Uh, but at the end, what you would be, what we should be f aiming for is that circularity is defined as much as possible by reusing your own material. Um, and so what we're seeing now is that there is a real competition happening in 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 the market for um, for for uh, for um, uh, beverage bottles, for instance, because that's one of the packaging that is the most collected. And so that's why what we are suggesting is that for you know startups or anyone you know, operating within the beverage bottle production that they they receive a first access to 
the recycled content from beverage bottles before it is given to other uh, to other applications. And if they don't need it, fine, it can go to other applications. But given the fact that there are these mandatory requirements and these um, food grade quality requirements, we think that you know at in the first place that they you know should be given access or the offer to use this material before it is given to other applications or you know, sold to other applications. Um, so that is, I hope that that somehow answers your questions, your question, Simon. Yeah, yeah. from the point of the uh, recycled uh, food grade packaging, yes. And I think that at some point or another, the return rate is going to be almost 100%. So it's going to be out of the way. But there's so much plastic going out there uh, in so many other applications. So that's my question. Yeah, and I, I think it's a, it's a very good point, interesting one. I, I've not closely considered this before, but um, I mean, I would agree with Nicolas that closed loose systems like this, of course, are what we are, we're, we're targeting. But beyond that, what we also want to see is a proper market for this, these waste streams. So actually that they have value and that um, effectively people are competing to buy. And that would be the, the healthy sister situation. Um, what we can also say is that local governments and regional governments do have a certain amount of um, Opportunity here it depends on how the the waste systems are regulated in different countries, uh, but it is possible to to determine that the waste collected within a particular territory is directed towards a, a, a particular type of use. Um, we're working in, in city loops on um, in, in the city of Appledorn in the Netherlands, which is collecting uh, waste from its green spaces, so cuttings and, and branches and leaves and grass, etc., and then trying to work with local um, startups and uh, SMEs to develop new products from that waste explicitly. And of course, that can be put then in uh, the tenders and contracts with uh, the waste collection companies that that's what should happen to it. There's not complete freedom um, in the waste sector, um, but there are still a lot of possibilities to do that. Um, and this is very beneficial for, for cities to be working with their local SMEs. And there are a number of cities that have established innovation challenges, etc. There's the startup in residence program in Amsterdam, for example, that are trying to do exactly this. And making those waste fractions available is uh, is quite an important part of that. Thank you, Simon. We also have questions in the chat. So I'll just read the first one here uh, from Artemis for Simon. What is the process for a city willing to sign and participate in the Circular Cities Declaration? Are there specific commitments after signing? Excellent. Yes, thanks for that. Uh, so, well, it's quite a simple process, really. There is a is a commitment document online, so that that is the Circular Cities Declaration itself, and that lists ten different commitments that we ask those who are signing up, which is both cities and regional governments, to commit to. And these mostly relate to the um, the levers which I mentioned before. So the the levers that local and regional governments have at their disposal to promote circular economy, and making sure that the cities and regions sign up to using those levers. The only commitment beyond that um, is that we ask that annually each city and region which has signed uh, provides us with uh, some information about what they've done over that year in a fairly similar simple reporting. Uh, uh, form and that information is then shared with us on the website. So really this is about the cities themselves taking the political decision to declare their support for circular economy and then we are communicating that to the outside world. So you can find more about it on the website link but of course I'm, I'm happy to share more with people um, if they have questions. Okay. Um, and there's also a question for Nicholas, um, an update. Yes, so Marilena is, is looking to to um, know if we have an, we could have an update on companies responsibilities in consumption bottles recycling and using and I see you replied yeah I, I think the easiest uh, um, is that uh, Marilena I invite you to visit our website because um, so I spoke about the industry commitments that we are making at UNESDA level but each individual member is obviously you know has their journey towards achieving these commitments and so we have uh, an overview of of, of those commitments uh, those individual company co company commitments or national association commitments on our website uh, actually being updated as we speak so um so if you bear with me you know the information you, you will see today is already very positive but in the next few days uh, you'll actually see an updated um, up the, uh, update of that information Okay, 
So um, I see we don't have any more questions. Uh, so I wanted to, and I see that we're actually closing in on our session, and um, I think it's time to actually look back and start to wrap up, if you don't mind. Um, so I wanted to ask for your takeaways. If there was one thing you'd like the, the people who've joined us today to remember about the conversation on cities and circularity, what would that one thing be? What would you want them to know about uh, the current state of circular cities from your particular point of view, but also in how it relates to the other sectors um, that that we uh, mentioned here today, because as we said, for me at least, uh, one big, big takeaway is that things don't happen in isolation. So um, the floor is yours. Go for it. Give us your 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 um, your main takeaway from this discussion. If, shall I start? Yeah, go that side. Okay. <laughs> because Liz, Liz took mine, so. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I mean, well, I would like as many cities listening, of course, to sign the Circular Cities Declaration. This would be a good outcome. But no, but beyond this, uh, for me, the the important point is the the uh, important role that cities, the local governments have to play in driving this transition. Um, but this is not something that will happen without local governments being really closely involved in the process, but also that they need to act as conveners uh, with the stakeholders in their territories. So the importance of involving citizens, of businesses, the education system, absolutely, uh, the scientific community, um, and the policymakers at all different levels of government will all be absolutely fundamental if uh, we want to achieve the transition that, that uh, that we need to make happen. Thank you, Sam. Can I continue then? Of course. Maybe it's a little, uh, just a, a kind of elaboration on that because I totally agree that this is really the main takeaway. It's not done in isolation and we need to, to, to act within both the political level and yes, what you just said, Simon. So thank you for that. But, uh, Maybe then also a good takeaway from this could be um, that we experience this. OK, so how how do we do that? I mean, how do we actually take that involving le uh, level into concrete action? So what I think we also discussed here was, OK, so how can we use, of course, communication, but also play playfulness? I mean, how can we involve kids in this? Uh, how can we actually understand if we talk about citizens involvement, for example, what I showed you, the pictures of like getting the material in your hands as to getting an understanding of, OK, this is still a material. This is still useful. This is not waste. So looking at it uh, with different uh, glasses, this just maybe like a, a very concrete down to earth, practical way of uh, of of seeing how you can do involvement. Um, yeah. I, I love what Anne said about the uh, uh, about ways being value, and Simon also said it. I think that that for me is indeed, uh, you know, um, I hope that a growing recognition that, you know, to break with this paradigm about waste being something bad, but that indeed, and litter is bad. I mean, don't take me wrong. I mean, litter is bad, but that we can turn this into a, into a valuable resource. Um, and that I hope that people will have seen that from an industry perspective, we're taking our responsibility, we're taking actions, uh, but that we're very keen to work with uh, uh, all actors at, 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 at all levels because it, it is a journey. It is a journey and we, you know, we, need, to, we need to make it work uh, together. Thank you very much, Lise. Thank you all. So once again, yes, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you for your work. And uh, thank you um, uh, also to everyone who has asked questions. Uh, it was a very interesting conversation. I, for one, have, have learned uh, a lot. Um, and if you would like to share your resources uh, in the chat for everyone to be able to, to, to access, I'm not sure um, if they will be shared uh, digitally on the, on the website afterwards. But um, yeah, I, I would like um, our participants to know as well that they, they can request that information. Um, yeah, and I will pass the mic back over to you. Um, Jessica uh, is here. I'm here. Don't worry. <laughs> so, uh, <yeah. laughs> 
<laughs> no worries. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Anne-Louise. Thank you, Simon. And thank you, Nicholas. Um, I have enjoyed the last hour and a half and a bit more uh, in tremendously. Um, thank you very much. Many different insights and the takeaways. Liz, thank you for moderating this. Um, very impactful on my side, I have to say. And as you mentioned, yes, we will uh, try to collect all uh, presentations if the presenters agree and we will try to share them afterwards at least in an email if not also on the website if possible and um, we will talk with us uh, about this in the team later um, so yeah thank you very much and um, thank you for your attendance thanks for all the questions as this already mentioned and with this we are wrapping up our morning session and we will come back together again later on at 1.15 CET. Uh, so this is in an hour and 15 minutes. We have some extra time here for our lunch break. And then we will go ahead with our speakers from research moderated by uh, David Pack, by Dave. And I'm really excited for that session. And also please feel free to tune in tomorrow to actually see from our contestants how they address these challenges we have been facing uh, and been talking about today in our morning session already and also in our afternoon session. So I'll see you all later and thank you all again. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.